very excited to be here today uh, for a number of reasons. I get to do this around the world. I've never been able to wear one of these boy band uh, microphones before, so this is very exciting. We've tried to work on a dance routine at the last minute, but didn't uh, come through. <laughs> so um, you've heard both from uh, John's initial speech as, as well as Mark. Um, cybersecurity requires an ecosystem with key stakeholders. That's why we selected the panel that we have today. So up here represented is, is government, industry, and academia. All are critical, whether you're talking about long-term long efforts like the cybersecurity moonshot or short-term things that require um, defending networks here and now today. By way of background, uh, my responsibility is to build our relationships with government and industry around the world in a collaborative way. I, um, I come from a government background. I worked at the National Security Council at the U.S. White House uh, and the Department of Homeland Security, so I very much relate to much of what John is going through. Um, Thank you. And uh, all of you out in, out in government. And, and our goal is to be an enabler uh, and a partner of, of government. Mark talked a little bit about our meetings yesterday in Canberra, um, both on the policy and the operational level. We were fortunate to meet with the Prime Minister, uh, Ministers Dutton, Taylor, Bishop, uh, as well as some of the operational leaders uh, like Mike Burgess and uh, Alistair McGibbon. And it's a testament to um, the focus that the Australian government has on the importance of cybersecurity. They recognize this is no longer a server room type issue. This is public and private. This is cross-sector. This requires national level importance. And, uh, and it's important to see that, that uh, type of leadership. Um, I'd add also that, that this is not just about having conversations. This is about facing common challenges that we see in the U.S. Uh, are shared with the challenges and the threats like John talked about um, and others around the world. So harnessing those best practices and, and bringing them to light um, on the operational side, on the policy side. And, and I think you're going to hear as, as we get into this today, um, we hope that this conference is, is not just a one-time conversation. Um, we hope that this is the start of a dialogue that builds true collaboration and, and relationships. Uh, with that, I'd, I'd like, John, could you talk a little bit more about the JCSC and some of the overall collaboration that you do? We, as, as we were preparing for this panel, we talked about the need to get um, some of the cybersecurity community like us better engaged in some of the wonderful work that's going on there, and, and that has top-down agreement from Mike Burgess and Alistair McGibbon, so we'd like to build on that here in, in Victoria. Yeah, certainly, Ryan. So um, the Australian government released its cybersecurity strategy in 2016, and um, a significant part of that is, was the establishment of joint cybersecurity centres in um, the capital cities. So we're fortunate in Melbourne um, the JCSC was opened in October last year and outstanding um, capability both in people and technology in that facility and it's in, in Burke Street and I encourage you all to, to reach out and um, they're very open to having inspections and also having you know, some of your leadership teams go through there and we've been focusing on that. But more importantly, um, there are some outstanding resources uh, across Australia to help in cyber security, but sometimes it's difficult to know who to reach out to and how to get to them. So the JCSCs provide a, a, a central point of focus and um, we leverage that extensively now. So when it comes to incident management and incident response, we can go through the JCSC and they can open up resources to us through the Australian Cyber Security Centre and, and other resources in Canberra. And also the JCSCs are taking on a role of threat intelligence. So they're, they're starting to run some sessions um, to industry and government, government at a Commonwealth, state and local level to provide some advisories on what's happening and more importantly how we as a group of professionals can respond to that. And I've been fortunate to be invited onto the board um, of the JCSC and um, outstanding um, capability, but it's up to us to leverage it as much as possible. That's great. Um, Carson, could you talk a little bit about the important work that you're doing both at Monash University as well as across the Oceanic Center? Yeah, I can do that. So um, I'm associate professor at Monash University half of my time, and the other half of my time I'm the director of the Oceania Cyber Security Center. It's yet another center. Probably people lose track a little bit of all the different centers. But it's actually a very unique thing because uh, what we managed to do is get eight universities to agree to collaborate in cyber security. Um, we have heard a bit about collaboration before. Everybody is saying, okay, this is actually the key. And we try to really 
do this, to foster collaboration in that space. So my background is not from academia. I actually come, you're probably here, you come from Germany, and the time in Germany I worked for Fraunhofer, which is an organization which is between academia and industry. So I'm very used to working across that, that gap between research and industry. And the, the idea of that center is to learn about all the capabilities that we have at the eight universities. So we have done that exercise of capability mapping, and we found there's around 120 academics just in Victoria working on different fields of cybersecurity. And now um, the role of the center is to be like a broker. So if you want to work with anybody in that space at one of the universities, you can come to us and we can hook you up with the right people. And if you need a team of somebody saying working on hardcore cryptography, um, post-quantum cryptography, and maybe also on data science in context to that, and maybe another field as well, you look at economic uh, effects of new disruptions, and you want to have that in a team, we can pull it together from the different universities. And we already have eight projects running with teams across universities. And actually, we find that researchers are quite excited to do that because usually uh, universities are competitive. Right. So they, they don't really work across that much, yep. but they really like to do that because they, they see there's a lot of value also for their professional development. So that's a center. Uh, looking at Monash universities, university there we have a, um, a group, it's called the Cybersecurity and Systems Group that I lead. And uh, we have, well, we've probably more focused on the really technical things like cryptography, like the holy grail in cryptography where you want to do computation on encrypted data. So if somebody steals your data, it always stays encrypted and you yep. only decrypt the results. Yep. And we try to get this towards an efficient way to do this. We're probably not there yet, but there's ways to do it. Um, we work on blockchain technology from the uh, hardcore inside. We look at uh, privacy in that space. Uh, things like, you would think that uh, authentication and privacy is kind of a contradiction, mm. right? But actually we can do that. We can authorize transactions and you still stay private with technology called ring signatures. Mm. So there's lots of fancy uh, developments and, and we think that we need to get into the development process very early, uh, not only looking at threats, but also taking all these technologies that we have over the different universities and bring that into the, into the process. But you need a lot of expertise to do that because some of this is really uh, difficult to understand. I mean, how many people know actually really how blockchain technology works? Mm -hmm. Everybody's talking about it, yep. but, but what's all inside and what are the different options you have? What are the effects? We have one university that works on the economic side, on the law side, on the regulation and effects on society. We have another university working on the, on the hard technology questions, putting a rigorous foundation underneath that. And that's just a few examples. We have lots of things across the board. That's great. And, and another great sort of illustration of how academia feeds into industry, feeds into policy and operational side. I, I know from my time uh, in the White House, one of the things that we heard from different members of industry um, who had been victimized was we need the ability to hack back or we need to go on to others' networks and take back what um, what has been taken from us. That has a tremendous amount of unintended consequences and you know usually badguy.com doesn't just launch an attack, right? He uses a lot of innocent and, and unknowing third-party infrastructure. The work that you all are doing on things like cryptography so that if your data is transiting off your own network, it is automatically encrypted, um, reduces the need for some of those types of things so that when the bad guys, if they are able to successfully execute an, a, an extraction, they don't necessarily have access to, to uh, what they were trying to steal. Pam, could you talk a little bit about, about your work around the world? Sure. Uh, so we have a team of industry experts um, that we actually hire from industries. And they are people that have amassed a great deal of cybersecurity expertise throughout their careers. And what we ask them to do is come work for us and turn that security expertise around to help practitioners like yourselves globally. So the way that we do that is um, teaching how to uh, adopt cybersecurity frameworks, for example, like the Purdue model in SCADA environments and the NIST cybersecurity framework and, and other frameworks and, and uh, even regulatory frameworks as well. And then help you all as practitioners to understand how to overcome some of the security challenges that you're facing, but speak to you 
understanding your world, understanding you as a practitioner in a healthcare environment or in a government environment or in education. So we truly understand the challenges that you face in your unique industry as well. So at first, as you can imagine, it's a little bit of a challenge um, talking to these practitioners and saying, now you want me to come work for a vendor and do what? exactly, um, but it has worked out beautifully and uh, we have a great partnership with all of you as practitioners um, that has led into some of the other activities that we've been doing as well. I don't That's know if great. you want me to talk about some of those yet or? Yeah, please do. So one of the things that, um, that we have been doing on the government side is collaborating on um, Pacific Endeavor as an example of a military exercise. Um, Australia was the co-host to Pacific Endeavor a couple of years ago. We were up in Brisbane at one of the military bases there and really working with the cybersecurity professionals within approximately 22 to 24 different nations so that we could exercise their skill set around cybersecurity, um, which then evolved into uh, later on the cyber range that Mark was mentioning. And I can talk about that more later, but that's one example of the kind of collaboration we can do uh, with industry. That's great. Um, I, I think it gets into a broader theme we've been discussing as well. So hands-on operational training and exercise feeds into a broader track of, of education. John, we had a breakfast discussion earlier. John was talking about um, the sort of three groups that you need to educate, which fully aligns to how we see things. One is senior executives, decision makers, those that are deciding resource allocations. And, and actually, I think it maps to the way that Pam has experienced going around to different industries. You need to speak in a language that they understand, whether it's a minister or a corporate board, CEOs, most of them don't come from a cybersecurity background. So how do you speak in a language that helps them understand the challenges that you're facing and applying the people processes and resources towards those type of things? The next, along the exercise track, the, uh, the, the broader efforts that need to go on in, in training the operators, um, and, and then the general public. John, do you want to talk about how you're approaching those? Yes, those certainly. Groups? So, um, you know, I, I guess when it comes to protecting ourselves, people, process, and technology are really important. And sometimes, as cyber professionals, we tend to think that the, the technology, the shiny tools and the flashing lights is what's going to help. There, there's definitely a place for that. But um, if you don't address the people and the process um, aspects, I think our effectiveness is really limited. So people, I'm pretty much an optimist. I think people will basically do the right thing if they understand the, the potential threats and impacts mm -hmm. and if we make it easy for them to do the right thing. So, yeah, Victorian government, we've identified a real distinction between awareness and training. So the awareness we're targeting, as Ryan said, three levels. So senior executives, ICT managers and the Victorian public sector. And then looking at behavioural change. What is it? that we want them to understand and how can we measure whether our training and awareness is being effective. So um, we kicked off yesterday our, our first foray into that and most of you would have seen lots of different modules around, training modules and also probably when you're inducted into an organisation there's some mandatory learning that you have to go through but a lot of it is, is pretty boring um, and so I think our approach is that when it comes to the, the senior level we have to speak in a language that they understand and we have to be able to frame technology threats into business threats. So we're positioning cyber as really a business risk and stop expecting your CIO to fix everything for you um, because it will impact confidentiality, integrity and availability and they all come under a business um, focus. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to the um, you know, Victorian public service as a whole, um, if we can um, direct our awareness to helping staff understand how they protect themselves at home, they're more inclined to bring that good practice to work. And so we're trying to, to make it more relevant to them and help them and, it's, and then cyber won't be an imposition It'll be just a, a way of how we do business. That's great. And, um, on that, that executive education piece, um, we try and contribute to that as well. I, I think uh, you all have access to the Navigating the Digital Age books. We just produced a, a new version of that with a forward from, uh, from Mike Burgess um, that is truly intended to get to, to those audiences at the, the corporate director level, the executive director within companies, and, and the ministerial level. Um, we did previous versions as well that were localized uh, to specific 
countries, and we had uh, submissions from Mike Burgess talking about the five no's from his previous roles when he was in private sector, as well as uh, now Ambassador Toby Feakin. Um, you're actually doing a, a, a great deal of educating of, of the future technologists of the world. Do you want to talk a little bit more about some of that? Do. Yeah. Well, we have, uh, we of course, educate um, specialists yeah. in, the, in the area. We have a, probably a rather um, small set of really excellent cybersecurity people coming out of university. But we also see um, cybersecurity as a kind of a literacy yeah. thing. So everybody should, mm -hmm. should learn about it. Also students who go through our data science curriculum or through, through other areas, uh, they need to know something about cybersecurity. Well, so what we did is push cybersecurity into uh, core units at Monash University. So at the moment I teach around 600 students each semester and first semester to, to give them some idea of what that is about. Um, some of them probably uh, then decide to go into that space. Actually, the numbers increase a lot since we've started doing this. And the others at least have some idea of what they need to look for and what they need to bring into, into the other space. And, uh, and then later, if we look at uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and all that, um, there's a lot of intersections between what we do in the security world. And we put that into the teaching and into the education. That's great. Um, there's another aspect to that. We, we also work with the countries in the uh, Pacific region uh, via the Oceania Cyber Security Center. That is the collaboration with Oxford University that I think Minister Philip Dalidakis mentioned yes. uh, um, before. Um, what we do there is we uh, have two researchers working with Oxford University, and we go into the countries and we do a maturity review mm -hmm. for the countries, which uh, means it's probably three days up to a week uh, meeting with people, having focus groups, having discussions, mm -hmm. and then uh, write a rather uh, longish report with all the details, all the different indicators that can then help people in that countries uh, to build their policy, to decide where to invest money, to again work with us to build capabilities. Nice. Um, this is a process that has started about uh, two months ago. We have done the first two countries, and the plan is to do 15 countries in the next three years. Um, because it's all interconnected, countries like Samoa will have five undersea ca cables in the next three to four years. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of bandwidth for 200,000 people. So they kind of leapfrog from having no connectivity in some places or to mobile phones and then to really having broadband internet. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a big change and a big challenge. Yep. And so the Oceania Cyber Security Center, together with Oxford, can play a leading role in coordinating activities in that space. That's great. Like, you know, uh, some of those emerging technology countries, uh, hopefully they can leapfrog some of the mistakes that the rest of us have made yeah, in this developmental idea, problem yeah. process. Sure. Um, we, we also partner with, uh, with Aspie and, and uh, um, Toby Feakin from his time there to now. Um, we're part of the Australian International Cyber Strategy and doing some of this executive level training we'll be doing in Singapore. Uh, while we're doing that internationally, though, we'd like to keep partnering with you and those of you in the audience to make sure we're not simply focused on ASEAN at the same time we're focused uh, here within country as well. Um, Pam, could you pivot and talk a little bit about uh, how do you see some commonalities and differences amongst some of the different industries and the threats they face and the way that they adapt to those things? I think uh, what's really interesting is bringing these practitioners together. And while they have, you know, again, their own unique perspective on their industry, um, there are a great deal of commonalities. And the commonalities are sometimes threat related, um, although sometimes you have highly targeted attacks that are unique to a particular industry. Um, but the thing that we are seeing across the board is a commonality around this rapid digitization and what that's doing to um, the teams within these organizations that are responsible now for this shared security responsibility. So you have people thrust into roles that are now responsible for security that have never really dealt with security before. And then you have um, roles that have traditionally been involved with security, but there have been silos. You know, there have been, you know, the IT responsibilities versus the OT responsibilities or the ICS SCADA responsibilities. And so how do you try to break down those silos and get those teams working together? Because again, it comes back to a shared responsibility. So I would say a lot of the industries like manufacturing, oil and gas, utility industries are still seeing that, that bit of silos between IT and OT. But then you look at traditional IT industries, um, such as healthcare, that doesn't have 
a great deal of the automation yet until now we're getting into the IoT world with medical devices and whatnot, but you still see a lot of the silos. And some of those silos exist between the NOC groups or the IT or networking groups, as well as the security operations teams. And also now DevOps, you know, and there are the religious wars about, well, my DevOps team is smarter and more security savvy than my security operations team that's been in place for a long time. So again, you know, our challenge is working across these teams and helping them to understand ways that they can effectively team together for this shared responsibility. And again, that is our goal with the Cyber Range as well, to bring these teams together and be able to exercise an experiential environment where they can understand one another's perspective. Um, we've also developed SCADA hands-on workshops, and I'd love to see more IT folks going through that so they can understand some of the SCADA security challenges in a real meaningful, hands-on, um, tangential way to what they're doing today. Um, so those are some of the commonalities that we see. Certainly, um, you know, commonalities across threats, but I think really getting down into how do we solve for some of these silos is going to be really important to, you know, the future of our ability to secure our enterprise organizations. That's great. And John, I know you, you all have recently helped out with some, some real-world incident response. Could you talk a little bit through that? Because the silos and the industries Pam are talking about are, again, not philosophical, but those are lifeline sectors, be it healthcare, be it energy, be it communications, and one depends on the other. If you have a hospital that doesn't have any electricity, if you don't have a generator, you're, you're in a tremendous amount of trouble. So could yeah, you certainly. talk through some of that? Yeah, and um, yeah, in the, the press over the last couple of weeks, most of you would have seen that there was um, an unauthorised activity that PageUp um, identified, and PageUp provides some HR services and some training services. So um, my role in Victorian government is if there's a cyber incident that's impacting a department or agency, I get notified. And then if there's a cyber incident that impacts multiple departments or agencies, I coordinate the state's response to that. So um, PageUp um, provided services to a whole range of blue chip organisations and um, there were, were some of our government departments, particularly a local government area. And you know, credit to PageUp, I think they identified this anomalous activity fairly early and took some steps to address it. And then they went on the front foot, they actually came out and um, you know, engage with their um, customers. Um, again, early. Sometimes the natural reaction for us as a profession is to criticise. Um, so I think we've got to change that shift. Uh, you know, we know that if there are sophisticated adversaries, they will get into your networks. So what's really important and, what, and how we will be judged is our ability to identify that and respond to it. So um, I think a lot of credit to page up and the JCSC um, actually took an active role as well. So um, CEO from page up um, was at the Melbourne JCSC and linked up to the other JCSCs and provided some briefings um, on what they had found and what their intended actions were and how they could communicate um, with their stakeholders. But you know, it's, it's a real good learning for us. So you know, some of you will probably have had incidents already um, there are others that will definitely have them in the future. And in your response to it, you need more than just the cyber techos. So you really need to be able to get um, good assistance from your comms people, from legal, a whole range of activities. You know, when there's a bushfire, um, we have bushfire brigades from around the state and even interstate that come and help. So I think when it comes to cyber incidents, we have to sort of take a similar approach. If we're able to help colleagues, whether they be in government or industry, and have kind of like a, a cyber reserve to be able to channel, I think that's the way we need to go to collaborate and, and to beat the bad guys going forward. Yep. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and, you know, there's an old saying in the emergency management community that the worst time to exchange business cards is during an emergency. And so having pre-established identify those stakeholders, having identified ahead of time where your potential vulnerabilities and your interdependencies are, is very important. So um, certainly we, we hope to be a partner with you all and I, I think more broadly across the, the community, again, um, the invitation from, uh, from the leadership in Canberra uh, and from 
you regionally to, to figure out how can we share cyber threat intelligence on a regularized basis. Mark McLaughlin talked a little bit about the Cyber Threat Alliance. So recognizing within the security industry that there's a tremendous amount of preventative and response information uh, that can be gleaned from cybersecurity vendors, those that are operating a, around the world. Um, how can we work together not to compete based on what we know as our intellectual property, but what we can do with that shared information. Uh, on, a, on a regular basis, we share with cyber centers like the JCSC if, if we've identified a campaign so that you all can take preventative measures as we prepare to, to publish those things. You can put the word out because uh, st stakeholders across critical infrastructure will go to you um, for best practices and adaptation. So th these are the types of relationships that we hope can, uh, can build on. Um, Pam, do you want to talk any more about some of the upcoming exercises or particular things that we'll be focusing on in the near future? Yeah, so I want to invite everyone, first of all, to Sydney, to our brand new Cyber Range Center there. Um, we are very excited, as Mark mentioned, to be, uh, to be launching that on Tuesday. And we want to continue to bring that out to new enterprise organizations as well that haven't had the chance to do that. So the way that we structure this is to provide this free um, to enterprise organizations that want to come out and spend the day um, going through and getting familiar with the breadth of attacks. What we do is pair you up in teams of two. Uh, one of you has responsibility for the network edge, the other uh, has responsibility for the data center, for example, and um, you are to defend your network in a level one class is what we're calling that. This is the baseline course. And it gives that practitioner the exposure to a breadth of attacks and, and threats. So um, exploits against clients and servers, uh, exposure to ransomware, uh, credential theft, uh, malicious websites and malicious domains and, and what that entails, and really being able to identify that in the traffic. But at the same time, you know, as a practitioner, and while that's the fun part, that you're actually um, having that experiential environment, we want everyone that participates to be thinking about, how am I dealing with this when I go back to work? Am I talking to my counterpart from a cross-functional perspective? What I'm doing today within my team, is that the way we operate across IT and OT or across security ops and network operations or DevOps? And so really thinking about your processes and that communication, as John was alluding to, that whole triad, if you will, the people, process, and technology. And yes, you use the technology to defend, but what happens at work when you're under fire, as we've all been talking about, um, at the time of an attack is, is just as critical. So we want you to come through, be able to exercise through those scenarios, and we'll be offering additional classes over time. Um, for any of you that may be in the Australian military, um, in the Pacific Endeavor exercises that happen annually, um, that is hosted by U.S. Pacific Command and another nation within Asia Pacific. And as I mentioned, Australia was kind enough to host two years ago up in Brisbane. It will be in Nepal this year, but the Australian military will be participating in that. And it will be the same similar exercises where we exercise not necessarily purely from the context of a cyber scenario, but in the context of a natural disaster because so many happen here within the Asia Pacific Rim. So what happens when your entire infrastructure goes down and now you have one comms channel and now you're gonna have a cyber attack against that one way that you're communicating with the outside world. So you'll see more exercises like that. Obviously, um, the Australian government will be participating in Pacific Endeavor. Um, and then we have the this, this SCADA hands-on workshops as well that are available to you here in Australia. So we hope that you take advantage of all these, you know, real life um, exercise opportunities here in the local area. Uh, John, one, one other key challenge here is, is the breadth of stakeholders as illustrated across the stage, but also as you're experiencing a, a cross government. So your position was established by the cyber, cybersecurity strategy within Victoria. Um, in, in the United States, we went through a similar process on a na nationwide level. So the Department of Homeland Security was given the responsibility to secure civilian networks and critical infrastructure. They were not given the directive authority to actually execute that even within government. So the way that that played out, uh, in one example in my time at the White House, Heartbleed vulnerability was revealed. Uh, there was a cabinet meeting. All of our uh, cabinet heads came together. Um, there was a direction from the top that said, every one of you will search for these vulnerabilities 
If you have them, you will patch them immediately. If you don't have the capability to search yourself, the Department of Homeland Security will search and will conduct the patching. Uh, everybody said great and went off. And because there was no legal authority for DHS to do that, we then spent several months having bilateral negotiations with the Department of Justice and each individual agency to actually give DHS the authority to execute that. So. Um, there's, a, there's an old saying that, that uh, one of my mentors has, which is the soft stuff is the hard stuff in cybersecurity, meaning the, that underlying policy and regulation actually drives real operational consequences. Um, how are you adjusting with that sort of coordination role and the, the policy and authority piece? Yeah, um, if I didn't say it was a challenge, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be putting it in the right position, right context. But so I work in the Department of Premier and Cabinet, which is, you know, a, a great uh, department to be in, but I don't have the authority to direct um, the other departments and agencies. So I spent a fair bit of time in trying to establish myself as a, a trusted advisor. And um, so, and collaboration needs to be a culture. Yep. So um, I'm fortunate that, you know, spending a bit of time in becoming a trusted advisor now, um, we have the ability to influence and, um, but also, I come from an audit background, and that's, that's quite useful, um, because in the Victorian government, we have the Victorian Auditor General's office, and um, so when I go to governance boards, I, I influence, and, but if I'm not confident that we're getting the level of um, support required, I can also reach out to my, my colleagues in audit. But at um, collaboration at a, a Commonwealth level, that's really stepped up, and I think because of recent, like the structural change in the Department of Home Affairs, and um, the ACSC now taking a more proactive role across industry and government at a Commonwealth, state, and local level, is really um, you know, embracing that collaboration. And um, I'm fortunate to be chairing something called a DSOM meeting, Departmental Senior Officers meeting, next Friday in Melbourne. And that has the CIOs from um, around Australia and also Commonwealth. So I, don't, I think when people say you can't, um, I think that's wrong. I think you should stop saying no because. I think you should start saying yes if. And, um, and that's probably our focus around collaboration now. So challenging. But um, people are prepared to collaborate. Often they need a little bit of leadership and sometimes a little bit of a nudge um, to make that happen. But I'm delighted to say that that's happening in my space. That's great. Um, that, that's a, a key balance. You know, trust is, is essential um, in those types of relationships. And that's why you have standing centers like JCSC and, and what you're building. Scalability is the next piece of that, right? Because there's only so many phone calls you can make during an emergency as well. So that's part of the, the balance here. Well, I think we are, we are getting out of time here. So I um, want to thank all of you. and want to thank our panelists here. I uh, hope this, as I said, continues to be a dialogue where we get operational outcomes from this uh, rather than just a, a one-day conversation. So look forward to meeting with as many of you as we can. And I think that is the same for the rest of our panelists here. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you.